Good afternoon. I'm Laura Schultz, Executive Director of Research for the Rockefeller Institute. I would like to welcome everyone today to this important forum on the intersection of two gut-wrenching public health crises, the opioid epidemic and the global, global COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we bring together policy experts and professionals on the front lines of battling the opioid crisis to share their experiences on what treating opioid addiction looks like in the middle of a global pandemic. Over the past two and a half years, researchers from the Rockefeller Institute's Stories from Sullivan Project have studied the opioid epidemic using a unique research in real time approach. The team includes Patty Strack, Katie Zuber, and Elizabeth Perez Chikas. Have, they have combined aggregate data analysis with on the ground research in the deeply affected rural New York County. The goal of this project has been to provide insight into what the opioid problem looks like, how communities have responded, and what policies have the best chance of making a difference. The work has informed agencies and committees at the federal and state levels. The research has also benefited local communities by amplifying their voices and helping policymakers understand the challenges they face. While the research had begun to document progress after a decline in overdose deaths in 2018, the trend came to an abrupt end in early 2020 as the COVID-19 pandemic spread. The team then began to document the stories from the front lines of the pandemic. The evidence suggests communities across the US may be experiencing a spike in overdose deaths as economic uncertainty continues and social distancing impacts patients' access to treatment. Today's conversation will be moderated by Patty Strzok, a fellow at the Rockefeller Institute and principal investigator on the Stories from Sullivan Project. The team's work was recently recognized by the American Political Science Association with the prestigious Outstanding Public Engagement and Health Policy Award for demonstrating leadership in improving health and the healthcare system through active engagement through active engagement in politics and policymaking. Patty is a professor at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy at the University of Albany. Thank you, Patty, for leading us in this important conversation. Thank you, Laura. Um, as Laura mentioned, we were on the front lines for um, over three years looking at how the opioid epidemic affects communities to really get a sense of what the problem looks like and why it's so hard to solve. And just as we were starting to kind of figure out what was going on, the um, pandemic hit COVID-19. And so we shifted our research to understanding what is happening during the pandemic. And, you know, it's not a surprise, but the opioid epidemic did not go away. And in fact, all evidence suggests that it's only gotten worse. And so what our goal here today is really to understand while our eyes are focused on COVID-19 and handling the immediate impact of COVID-19, we can't lose sight of the other um, serious health problems that we are also dealing with in New York State and in, across the United States. So we assembled some experts here today um, to give us a perspective, both kind of a, a bird's eye view of what's happening across the country, what, what the situation looks like, and also um, kind of an on the ground, boots on the ground perspective of what's happening in different communities in New York State. Um, and so we're gonna start with an overview by Shelly Weitzman, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what's, what's happening um, overall. Uh, Shelly is the Associate Director of the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. And her work uh, focuses on the opioid epidemic, addiction policies, barriers to treatment for substance use disorders, public health approaches to drug policies, and how law can promote access to treatment and support recovery. Now, Shelly is unique in that she has this very um, national perspective uh, being located down in DC, but she also has a background in New York State. She worked as the Assistant Secretary for Mental Hygiene in Governor Cuomo's office, and she was uh, formerly the Policy Director for Managed Care at the New York State Office of Mental Hygiene. So I'd like to turn it over um, to Shelly to give us an overview. Great, thank you so much, Patty, and I'm really pleased to be here. I'm going to um, pull up a little PowerPoint. Um, 
So as Patty said, I work right now at Georgetown Law Center at the O'Neill Institute, which is basically like a think tank um, where we work at the intersection of public health and the law. We also do a lot of work um, related to substance use disorder and criminal justice. And before I came to Georgetown, I was in the governor's office in New York um, and at the state office of mental health for several years. And um, so my perspective is really a very kind of government focused. Uh, I'm a lawyer and I, uh, you know, I'm particularly pleased to be presenting with Rockefeller because I was an empire fellow for several years uh, with the Rockefeller Institute. And I just think that the work that is going on there is phenomenal. And I'm just really honored to be with all of these panelists today who are all doing innovative work. I'm also a person in long-term recovery myself. Um, I've been in sustained recovery for 23 years. And it's important for me to share that because while we're talking about uh, you know, this crisis today, um, I, I think it's really important for people to know and see that people do recover and live and thrive um, in recovery. And I know that there's a lot of folks on this call right now who I know personally, um, who've been doing this work for a long time. And I just want to thank everybody for tuning in because this is a critical, critical issue. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, let's see. So this is just a few slides about our initiative. So I'm not really going to kind of get too much into it. Um, except to say that we're launching a new master's in addiction policy and practice at Georgetown that we're really excited about um, coming up here this summer. So, you know, the topic, obviously, we are certainly in an epidemic within a pandemic. And we have the American Medical Association who are saying that more than 40 states have reported an increase in opioid overdose mortality. Um, that means deaths. Uh, the CDC recently released some information uh, that uh, in a survey from June, one in eight adults surveyed reported increase in their substance use since the pandemic began. And just in the first part of the year, January to March, so we're really talking about the tip of when this pandemic began, there already was a 10% increase in fatalities as compared to the same time last year. So this could be attributed to, you know, partly the COVID pandemic, but also um, issues that have been on the increase and in trends over the last several years, which is uh, synthetic fentanyl in the drug supply um, and other kind of challenges with the drug supply. So here's kind of a snapshot of across the country what's going on. And we can see here that the numbers are pretty dire. So Cook County, Illinois, that's Chicago. Um, we have overdose fatalities up 28% in the first part of this year compared to last year. Um, in Maryland, we have drug and alcohol related deaths up over 9% from January to June and opioids were tied to nearly all of those deaths. Um, just one emergency department in Virginia, you saw an increase from 102 um, non-fatal opioid overdose cases to 227, so that's more than double um, March through June of this year as compared to last year. And of those patients, this year, 80% of those patients were black. So we have a real kind of challenge um, in that community. Rural South Dakota, 50% from January to March. California and Florida, 20% from January to March. That's a thousand more deaths in each of those states compared with last year. Seattle, April to June, 133% higher. So what we're really starting to see is the numbers, and these are early numbers, right? Because there's a bit of a lag when you're talking about um, looking at mortality across the country. And we're already seeing a significant spike. Um, and why is this? Well, <laughs> you know, we know that COVID-19 and the impact of it is bringing about the conditions in which substance use disorder thrives, 
right? We have social isolation, we have um, economic challenges, challenges with job losses, with um, childcare, with just, you know, stressors, right? And this is, these are the conditions where addiction really thrives. And on the other hand, we also have a lot of challenges um, act with folks accessing treatment when they do need help. So it's really um, the perfect terrible storm. Um, again, some early data. This is on syringe services programs, which are a critical frontline um, harm reduction service. Um, people go and uh, receive syringes, receive testing for HIV, hepatitis C, um, medication for opioid use disorder, um, other really critical services. And this is just, you know, early data, 25% of syringe services programs reported closing one or more sites um, and 43% reported a reduction in services. This is out of 173 uh, programs. Same with reentry services. I mean, these are, again, critical services, folks leaving jails and prisons to get supports, get connected to care, um, housing, et cetera. Uh, this report, 75% of these programs either closed or stopped providing some services. And this is 126 programs across the country. Um, this study recently came out, um, uh, I guess about a week ago, and really critical data here, let, looked at EMS data and overdose-related cardiac arrests. So we have almost 50% um, increase. So this is really staggering uh, numbers here. Another um, survey from Addiction Policy Forum about the impact on access to treatment. 34% of folks reported disruptions or changes in their access to treatment, 14% inability to receive services, 4% um, of folks reported that they experienced an overdose um, since the pandemic began, and 24% that they, their own substance use or a family member's substance use has changed, um, and that's a 20% increase in substance use. So, um, you know, and we see it in the news also. I mean, this is New York. I mean, th th those were, you know, nationwide snapshot. In New York, obviously, we had um, some real, uh, you know, some reporting in the capital region, in Erie County, obviously New York City, on and on, right? Um, and I think I, I personally know folks that, friends that have passed away from an overdose during this pandemic, and I'm sure that folks, um, you know, on this call have as well. So we are really looking at um, a major challenge. Um, here, a, a little bit, uh, I say a list of, you know, all the issues that this impacts, right? Um, programs uh, not able to do intake the same way, do crisis services the same way. We've got emergency departments, um, you know, being full with COVID-19, uh, a move to telehealth. And I know that a lot of providers have done just heroic work in moving from um, in-person services to telemedicine. And in some cases, it can be really good for, for patients. Um, we've, we've heard reports of folks who, um, there was one um, addiction medicine doctor I was speaking with in Tennessee, and he was talking about how they moved to telehealth. He, he does a lot of work in kind of rural Tennessee. And he was talking to his client, who, his patient, who was calling in from his car because he was living in his car. And the doctor didn't know, had, didn't know that, you know, he hadn't, the patient hadn't told him that, but he was able to see the person's living situation. And um, they were able to access care in a little bit easier way. So, you know, in some cases we've seen the move to telehealth be positive. In other cases, it's really been a struggle for folks. Um, workforce challenges, transportation, um, you know, I'm not going to kind of go through every single one of these because, you know, I think, um, you know, it's, it's complex, right? Um, I do want to point out here that, that an influx of um, very potent, illegally manufactured fentanyl and methamphetamine in 
conjunction with this pandemic in a time where people are really struggling to access services has really um, kind of pushed this over the edge. So, you know, the good thing that we're seeing is some real innovative um, responses from government and from programs. We're seeing, I mean, this um, picture in the top left corner, this is from the police, police assisted, um, I think it's the Addiction and Recovery Initiative, PARI in Massachusetts, giving people naloxone kits um, and information when they are leaving the local jail. Um, we've got in New York City, um, methadone delivery, home delivery, which, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but, you know, unheard of before the pandemic and now people can get access and, you know, really an explosion of online um, supports, apps, phone, you know, phone um, resources, mental health resources. So, you know, a lot of folks have really kind of stepped up um, uh, in light of this pandemic. So, you know, the other thing really I think is important to know is it's not just access to treatment, right? We have a cascade effect um, on all the services and supports and systems that touch addiction, prevention, treatment, and recovery. So, you know, one really critical piece is here is on state budget impact. So you had states in New York no exception, that had to scramble to get ventilators, get services up and running, um, you know, really have a robust response to um, COVID-19 and all that stuff costs money. And it's not, you know, new money. Um, and I think, you know, states and local government are really struggling right now with how do we make those budget gaps up? You know, do we do across the board cuts? Do we move and shift services around? So I think we haven't even seen yet the true impact of um, some state budgets just really being gutted um, from the impact of COVID-19. We have an increase in folks seeking food stamps, SNAP uh, benefits, unemployment insurance. Um, there have been some uh, states and counties that have you know, been proactive in releasing folks from jail um, because, you know, that can be a place where COVID-19 can spread, um, but a struggle in connecting people to services. And what's the impact of that? Loss of health insurance. Obviously, folks have employer-based health insurance often. Um, so, you know, on and on and on, right? And this little chart is um, about deaths in Oregon and Washington that they've seen a, an increase in deaths overall, not just from COVID-19. And some of them are overdose deaths, but um, some are, are other, other things, right? So we have a real ripple effect. Um, let's see where I am on time here. <laughs> so, you know, All right, what's being done about it? So of course we have a federal public health emergency, states have done public health emergency declarations and that's opened up some flexibility in access to services. So rules governing um, telemedicine, access to medication, social distancing and gathering limitations, um, privacy rules for telehealth and reimbursement of, of telehealth services. The federal government didn't reopen nationally the health exchanges for people to get um, access to health insurance, but multiple states uh, made the decision to reopen their own. Um, and uh, we had a federal stimulus package, which, you know, was probably a start and hopefully more to come. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing. I, I think that folks are really focused on um, as a, a targeted response to uh, opioid use disorder. So we, I think as most folks know, there are several medications that are used to treat opioid use disorder. And these are evidence-based, um, they cut overdose significantly. 
um, methadone and buprenorphine, which is also known as Suboxone, are both heavily regulated by the federal government. Um, and so part of the public health emergency um, on the federal side involves opening up access um, to these medications, I think in ways that providers um, and uh, advocates have long wanted to see happen and government folks, I would say state government folks in particular have long wanted to see happen. So for example, to get access to buprenorphine, there has to be an in-person medical evaluation. Well, one of the rules that um, was waived preemptively is that prescribers can skip that. They don't have to, but they can and just start somebody right on medication via telehealth, um, still required for methadone. And telehealth now may be used to treat patients receiving methadone and buprenorphine. Um, methadone is something that is dispensed from a clinic. Many folks have to go every day, um, particularly when they start. Um, and so, you know, going every day, standing in line, being with dozens of people, is health risk in a pandemic. So um, here there's been an expansion of telehealth doorstep delivery, um, which New York City has done in a lockbox um, and more flexibility for providers to give people take home dosing. Um, so 20 days for folks that are more stable, 14 days for folks um, that need some more supervision. Um, and expanded prescribing across state lines, right? Right now to prescribe buprenorphine, somebody has to have a special waiver from the DEA called an X waiver. And this, these rules were, you know, are pretty rigid. And now we can have expanded prescribing um, as long as the prescriber, um, before they had to be licensed in both states. Now you can just be licensed in one. And so to enable these things to take effect, state the state itself has to take action. They have to allow the use of telehealth under state licensing requirement, allow initiation of buprenorphine um, via telehealth, making sure that telehealth can include just a phone call, not a video call. Um, sometimes that might be better, but people might not be able to access that. Um, go to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare um, uh, services federally and ask for uh, Medicaid to be able to be used to reimburse counseling and peer support um, and expand access to these other uh, services and resources. And that's what we're seeing. New York certainly has done it um, and states across the country have really stepped up. So, you know, what's the result so far? Um, and this is about the ex expanded access to methadone and buprenorphine. There are a lot of entities that are doing research on this right now. Um, the CDC has just um, started getting responses back from a survey of ex wavered prescribers on the impact of relaxed rules in prescribing buprenorphine. We have some early data from Massachusetts um, showing that, you know, zero over deaths due to increased methadone take homes. Um, so, you know, I think that we're going to start to see what is the impact of these rules and should they be made permanent? Um, I think that that's what the question is. Um, is it enough? I, I'm sure other folks will opine. I would say definitely not. A lot more work to do. Um, you know, we're, we're just putting out fires and we have um, addiction treatment providers, harm reduction organizations, folks really struggling. Um, last slide. Um, so there are some bills in Congress that are getting some momentum um, to kind of take some bold action, Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, which does many things, but it removes that special DEA license requirement. Um, the TREATS Act, which would make that regulatory flexibility permanent, expanding access to mobile methadone, which is prohibited right now, um, you know, targeted expansion of Medicaid for people that are justice involved. People in jails can't get Medicaid right now, generally. 
Um, so some efforts to expand Medicaid to folks that are in jail. Um, stimulus bill that's being negotiated right now to address all these conditions that you know are really the true cause here. Uh, the CARE Act, $100 billion for addiction, I think, in mental health. The Biden plan, $125 billion over 10 years. So, you know, a lot of possibilities um, and it remains to be seen uh, what the next steps are. So thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Um, I think Shelly did a great job of explaining the um, unprecedented stress that people and communities are under and also the unprecedented flexibility um, that's happening right now with uh, regu regulations. And so we're gonna turn and give you a picture of what's happening um, on the ground and some of the innovative ways that our communities in New York are dealing with the um, opioid epidemic during the pandemic. So how, how are people, what's the problem that people are facing and how are our communities uh, dealing with it? So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Sheriff uh, Craig Apple, who was elected sheriff in 2011. He's the sheriff of Albany County. Um, he oversees uh, 720 employees with an $80 million operating budget. And we are very lucky in Albany, New York. I follow a bunch of people who study sheriffs and they're always telling these stories. But um, in Albany, we have a sheriff that really is committed to innovative programs, including the Sheriff's Heroin Addiction Recovery Program, um, Medication Assisted Treatment Program, and his latest uh, program to convert decommissioned uh, jail cells into transitional housing to assist the homeless population in Albany. So um, without further ado, Sheriff Apple, I turn it over to you. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for the invite and thank you to Rockefeller Institute. And um, it's always great to be on a panel with Shelley. This is my second one from Georgetown. Um, so I don't have too many uh, minutes here, so I'm gonna throw a lot out really fast and then I'll sit tight for some questions later on. So in 2013, 2014, um, we noticed an abundance of heroin deaths. And unfortunately, um, the overdoses were just literally stacking up and we're like, what is going on here and what are we doing? Obviously, many in the field know that there has always been a shortage of beds and there continues to be a shortage of beds today. So we tried to do something different and we figured, hey, let's try and do a treatment center inside. So we partnered up with Oasis. Um, they were awesome to work with. And the next thing you know, we have, um, I'm an acronym guy. So we got the Sheriff's Heroin Addiction Recovery Program. Um, the inmates um, that were in there um, created their own logo, which was pretty much like an eagle with talons snapping a needle um, and saying, you know what, we're committed. And then dot, dot, dot to not coming back to jail. So that was awesome. We had um, volunteers that came down. We filled it up on day one. Um, you know, back then the overdoses, uh, we were getting about 30 to 40 to 50 a year. Um, last year was 60. Um, as I sit here in front of you right now in Albany, we've had 83 overdose deaths, um, up about 30%. And we still have a few weeks left of this year on top of those are the overdose deaths that we know of. And as we know, there's still a coding issue in the EMS world where some may go down as a respiratory distress, heart attack, whatever the case may be. So I'm sure that number is probably uh, much larger of a number. So anyway, we started with the SHARP program. And um, at the time, I was very skeptical of Suboxone, um, petrified of it because as a sheriff and a long-term employee in the sheriff's office, I'm in my 34th year, um, I had seen Suboxone smuggled in. I had seen families destroyed by um, people smuggling it in. So instead of having just a son in there, we may now have a son and a daughter because she tried to smuggle Suboxone into her brother. Um, basically, it was just out of, you couldn't take it anymore, seeing him cry and, and detox and, um, and it was rel relatively inhumane. So I had a focus on Vivitrol. Um, I was really excited. I thought this was the miracle drug and you know we're gonna save the world. And I couldn't get the buy-in. And I was uh, again, petrified of other drugs. And I always thought that, you know, detoxing was a one size fits, fits all and that, um, you know, it's they're going to go through some hard days, but then we can, you know, we can pick it up and help them and come to find out I was grossly wrong. And, um, and it was one of the probably more inhumane things to, um, to let people go through that type of detoxing. So um, battling back and forth to, with Keith Brown. And um, he's like, listen, let's, let's please consider Matt. And I'm like, what is Matt? 
And he's like, it's medically assisted treatment. And he broke it all down. So we started, Matt, with a collaborative um, um, group of uh, Oasis and Whitney Young and Center for Guidance and um, obviously my staff. We needed my staff to buy in as well. We started the Matt program with um, very little money. And um, to date, we've treated hundreds, um, upwards of six or 700, uh, mostly with Suboxone. That's probably 67%, I think was our latest stat as of yesterday, that um, most would go with Suboxone. And um, some still will try Vivitrol or Naltrexone. Um, we had a little issue initially um, with folks cheeking um, the pill. So we had to go to the dissolvable strips. Um, but I got to tell you, our six, our six month stat post release is at 70% still linked to Matt. And of that 70%, there's only a 5% recidivism. So that means these folks are getting the treatment they need, they're staying in it, and they're not going out there and doing you know, horrible things to try to feed their habit um, because they didn't have a job or whatever the case may be. So with the mat, um, we're like, all right, well, now we've got their attention and they're in recovery and they're doing great. Um, let's try to continue this. What can we do? So we didn't realize, but um, I was quickly, it was, it was brought to my attention that 64% of probation and parolees getting out of jails, county jails and um, state prisons had nowhere to go. So what do we do? Um, I'm like, well, you know what? Our population is, it's a bit of an anomaly right now. It's, a count, it's actually a countrywide anom anomaly with the um, census being very low. And um, so we have a 1140 cell jail here in Albany County, which is kind of bizarre itself, considering the county is only 325,000 um, populated. So we took uh, 100 cells and um, created a new um, entrance exit um, by cutting a hole in the wall, which is not something we usually advocate in jails. But um, we were able to create um, basically a homeless um, shelter. And um, we call it the ship and um, it's been awesome. We've got um, no more than 13 to 15 individuals living in there at any given time, mainly by our choice because of uh, COVID-19 and we wanna make sure that everybody has social distancing. Although with the cold temperatures coming in, we are um, prepared, we could put 50 in there if we had to. Um, but we've been able to take these individuals now and give them the support. And I always say that everybody on this call um, probably needed support at some time. Somebody was down on their luck, whether it was college loans or didn't have enough food in their house for a weekend, whatever the case may be, everybody needs support at some time. And I think that's as uh, government, let alone as elected officials, that's what we're supposed to do here. So um, we've been able to take people who have been in and out of jail for 30 and 40 years, um, pick them up, treat them, get them into our housing program, set them up with their, um, whether it's still continued addiction treatment or maybe it's mental health um, treatment because a lot of folks with addiction are fighting a mental health illness. And we've been able to treat them, get them job skills, get them out into the working world. And just this week, we moved two individuals who had saved thousands of dollars by working and coming home and saving their money in a partnership with a local financial institution. Um, set up digital banking. And these individuals now have got their first month, their last month, their security, everything, and um, are living the dream that everybody on this is living. I mean, that we're all going out and being able to shop and be able to go places. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has got us kind of, you know, hunkered down a little bit, but it's still, um, these folks are finally being able to live. And, um, and I think that's, you know, that's one of the most gratifying days is when one of them call me or write a letter and send it down here and go, listen, that program saved my life. And because of that program, I'm now able to, you know, have a rented apartment in my name for the first time, have a leased car in my name for the first time, um, have a girlfriend or a boyfriend for the first time. So um, the program's working. We've, again, put dozens through it, but that kind of almost closes the full circle for us with all of our services. And then we've just recently added in a mental health component where we're teaming up mental health. And some of, I have um, 90 EMTs and paramedics that work under our, uh, under the sheriff's office here. So we're teaming them up and sending them out as well. So um, we're trying everything we can do. Unfortunately, the, this pandemic and addiction at the same time has really just been a perfect storm. But, um, you know, I know some people on the call are probably saying, well, geez, you shouldn't have to go to jail to get treated. And I agree with that. Um, but unfortunately, right now, that's one of the best programs that we have up in this area to offer um, for those that are getting hit with low level crimes. Um, when bail reform came in in 2020, it kind of restricted us a little bit. So we're having some people fall through the cracks because 
we're not seeing them now. They're not coming to jail. So they're staying out on the street. And unfortunately, they're continuing to overdose. So those are the, the next target group that we really want to try to get and, um, and come up with a program to really latch on to them and bring them either back up to our shelter or into another program within the Capital District, which there's, there's um, you know, we've got some awesome programs here locally. Um, and I will say real quick that all the inmates that come into our jail, we immediately sign up with the Affordable Health Care Act. I'm trying to speak very fast. I'll be done in a second. We immediately sign up to the Affordable Health Care Act um, so we can get them on Medicaid upon the release. And all of our inmates going out are trained with Narcan. So that Narcan is out on the street. And, um, you know, maybe if they relapse, somebody can save their life or they can save somebody else's life. So thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. And now moving from the capital region down state, uh, we have Debbie Ann Fletcher Blake, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Vocational Instruction Project Community Services. And um, the VIP offers integrated medical, behavioral health, housing, and wraparound services to improve the health and well being of the Bronx and the surrounding communities there. Um, prior to that, she was the Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer at Morris Heights Health Center in the Bronx, and she also served as the Assistant Executive Director of Care for the Homeless, a federally qualified um, health center specializing in homeless health care. Uh, she's active in building culturally competent workforces, tackling health care inequities, and focusing on strategies to eliminate disparities, and working to ensure community members are active participants in deciding systems of care. And if that's not enough, she's also a uh, certified uh, family nurse practitioner. So Debbie, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Patty. Uh, and thank you for having me. Let me try to share my screen here. Let's try this again. It's just one second. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you again for having me um, and um, happy to be here. The VIP Community Services is a health center in the Bronx, as Patty said, and uh, we offer quite a, a number of services, wraparound services for our patients, um, including primary care, um, integrated behavioral health, housing, uh, shelter, and vocational services. Or addiction services are uh, consist of an outpatient treatment facility, two residential programs, one of which is co-ed. We have a 24-hour open access uh, center and a 1500 capacity methadone program. So just a few facts uh, about what's happening in the city. You may have already known know this fact that in New York City, someone dies every seven hours from overdose. And um, in the state of New York, more people die from drug overdoses than homicides, suicides, and motor vehicle crashes combined. Specific to the Bronx, uh, when we think about um, overdose is related to, and people going to emergency department and also hospitalizations, the Bronx leads New York City. Almost, the rate in the Bronx is almost twice as high for emergency department visits and hospitalizations as New York City. And when we look at uh, heroin overdose and hospitalizations, there's almost a, the rate in the Bronx is almost three times as high as New York City. If you remember nothing else that I'll say to you about COVID and New York, I want you to think about this picture because it tells a story of what we are experiencing and what COVID is doing. So here we are. And um, if you look to the far left, this guy is pretty stocked. They're at a um, baseball game and this guy is pretty stocked up. And so he has all the resources necessary to keep him grounded and the guy in the purple over here, the little guy, he represents our treatment system and our patients. And so what COVID did, uh, you can see he's not anchored and COVID came in and it affected him tremendously. And so what we saw and what we experienced during um, and what we continue to experience during this pandemic is health inequities, um, access to chronic care, access to primary care, access to medication uh, assisted treatments as facilities close, um, access to research and information to 
provide uh, treatment guidance um, is lacking. Delivery systems had to change because of COVID, the workforce. Some of us had to lay our staff off or, or um, reduce the, the workforce. Um, we pivoted pretty quickly to telehealth, um, but with that came challenges both for the providers and also for our patients that we serve because many did not have um, the skill sets. Um, many providers didn't have the infrastructure to pivot as quickly as they should have, uh, including us. Uh, many patients did not have internet access, both from um, a broadband perspective and also from um, just not having the capabilities, the computer access at home. We saw um, we pivoted quickly to take advantage of the flexibilities in prescribing uh, for, for um, substance use. And what we saw when we did our risk stratification is that us too had problems that were similar to the patients that we serve. Um, patients talked about not having um, storage at home um, and not feeling connected, no longer coming in. As I said before, we have a 1500 capacity methadone clinic and we reduce or daily um, the number of patients who came in daily from about 1300 down to 400. So that took some stress on both the patients and also on our system of care. And then the um, social determinants, I call them so social impediments of health because they impede health. Uh, housing, uh, overcrowding. And so uh, for patients who live in overcrowding situations, uh, they reported having difficulty storing their medications and we had to uh, address those issues. Unemployment was a big issue for us, food insecurity. What we did, we started serving meals when patients come in uh, to receive their medications. For our patients who receive uh, services um, groups, we pivoted to providing groups telephonically for those who could participate and also um, did some virtually for those patients who had the capabilities and the capacity to do so. But many of our patients complained of feeling isolated because they could not connect with us because of uh, technology. So, how can we address what's going on with COVID? I, I wanna talk a little bit about that. So this little guy here in the purple and our systems at large need more than this guy or even the person in the middle to be able to see over the fence to enjoy the, the ball game. If you look in the center here, this is equality and equality doesn't really make a difference here because our systems are still below the fence. So what we try to do is we try to put more in because we are building equity into the care that we're providing. And equity means giving more to those who need it the most. And so our systems of care need more than other systems that as you see are already stocked or have resources that they can actually enjoy the ball game, so to speak. So in order to give more to um, our systems of care and our patients, we need to look at legislations. And Shelley spoke a lot about um, some of the flexibilities we have. And what I'm hoping will happen um, for or um, substance use programs is that we become essential because things like vaccines um, if we're essential, then we know we will receive vaccines and we can vaccinate our patients and, and provide those resources so or um, we can be stable um, as we move through this pandemic and, and into the future. Uh, we need funding. We need um, reimbursable uh, to look at our reimbursement structure so that we can have resources and you know, we started looking at that too, looking at um, models of reimbursement that will be sustainable so that we won't be in the situation where we don't have resources and we have to reduce our workforce. Then we look at um, workforce and invest in our workforce. We've started doing that, looking at training, recruitment and retention and how you know, we can improve there, but we need external help. 
Um, we need dedicated resources for that. We need to look at testing sites to make sure that for um, professionals like KSAC T's, they're not competing with truck drivers for test site for, for testing dates and, and locations because um, they're taking up by other professions. And then looking at the structural determinants and invest in infrastructure, infrastructure for providers and also for patients. So some of those infrastructures, technology infrastructure to make sure that communities have broadband access that they need and internet access so that we can build resiliency and we can also um, ensure that everyone has the same access to and, and remove the digital divide. And finally, we, um, and Shelley laid it out for, uh, we need research to understand which of the flexibilities around MAT should, should continue. We also need uh, increased access and we've done that. We've worked on same day access for patients to come in and get medicated, um, but we also need to as a provider myself, we need to um, remove some of the barriers for prescribing. So I'm very happy to see that bill, Shelley, and I, I hope it goes through. So those are some of the things that we have done, and I'll be happy to talk more um, about what is what else is needed because I have more on this slide and um, how to maintain a structure that is um, safe and that is resilient and sustainable. We need to put more into the, the, the systems that need um, have the most need. Thank you. Thank you, Divian. Um, I just wanna remind the audience that, that you can submit questions using the Q&A uh, button on the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. So if you would like to submit a question, we'll be taking questions, please do so now. We'll collect those and we'll have, uh, we'll go through them in just a little bit. Um, before we do that, I would like to introduce you, um, John Bennett, who is the Executive Director of the Genesee Orleans Council on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, or GCASA. Um, he has been employed there for 21 years and worked in addiction uh, for 35 years. He is an early adopter of Western, one of Western New York's um, first opioid specific outpatient programs. And he is a founding member and co-chair of the Genesee Orleans Wyoming Opioid Task Force comprised of over 100 organizations and 450 members. The task force was named the Outstanding Rural Health Program of the Year by New York State Association of Rural Health and was recognized by the National Organization of Offices of Rural State Health. So um, we're moving from New York City in, into Western New York and really looking at some of the innovation happening out in Western New York in our rural communities. So John, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Pat. And uh, while well, I'm just sitting here listening to the other speakers and I'm you know, just so impressed with what's going on around, around the country and around the state. So. Often uh, rural counties have all the same problems uh, with far fewer resources. Uh, we cover huge geographic areas uh, that uh, are often very poor. Uh, I believe uh, one of the counties we serve is one of the poorest in the state. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, socioeconomic uh, problems that happen uh, up in this region. Uh, what I wanna do though, is take a little bit of time to go back and, and say where we were, what we did, and then what happened to all of that when the pandemic hit? Um, so if you go back to 2016, uh, Erie County was number one in the state uh, for opioid overdose deaths at 32 deaths per 100,000. The following year in 2017, Genesee County was at 36 deaths per 100,000. So our county got hit pretty heavy uh, back in 2017. We wrote a grant uh, to the Greater Astra Health Foundation, um, which was funded, and, uh, and that's how we uh, organized the Tri-County Opioid Task Force, uh, which was really driven to build uh, access to care initially, uh, but also to address some of the other social determinants of, of health in a rural community and to try to build um, you know, those resources. Uh, as, I, as Pat said, it has grown to 450 members from all community sectors. We have six work groups now. Um, one is access to care, law enforcement, data, naloxone, education, and a family work group. I'm just going to give you a quick list of the things that we've done in the past three years. Um, 
we started a PARI program, which uh, Sheriff Apple mentioned. We have uh, police assisted addiction and recovery in initiative. I think it's one of the first in the state that the um, fire department uh, built out a small waiting area and the fire department also participates. We have new grants uh, to include a 25 bed women residential program, women and children, a 20 bed detox. We built an OTP. So we built a methadone clinic back in 2018. We had a grant for crisis housing. We got a grant for, uh, it was a Cody grant through the Center of Treatment Innovation to build a mobile unit. We expanded jail services to include medication in two counties, including uh, methadone in one. Uh, we developed some permanent housing through the Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative. We opened up an 8,000 square foot recovery recreational center, which included uh, a workout center. I mean, people in recovery want to do all the same things that everybody else does. And so this has, uh, and actually it has like a sober bar area, which has a band uh, in it. It has karaoke. It has TVs to watch sporting events. It has a workout center. It has ping pong pool, video games, uh, computer center, uh, conference room. I mean, it really is decked out. Uh, and uh, we, uh, wrote some grants that uh, allowed us to do some transportation for patients to and from services. We developed childcare, which was sorely lacking. We developed a re-entry program for uh, offenders coming out of jail, which included housing. We have a federal grant for the neonatal pregnancy and postpartum mothers. Um, we developed a 24 seven opioid crisis hotline with peer support. So we have about 10 peers that will go out uh, and uh, partner with hospitals. So the EDs will call them if somebody shows up in an overdose uh, and anybody can actually call them and we will deploy somebody within two hours. Uh, we've taken a ton of people to open access clinics in the middle of the night um, as well as gotten uh, my physician at sometimes on a Sunday night will prescribe uh, methadone for somebody. Um, we developed a website. Um, we sent a mailer out to every household in the Tri-County region uh, regarding addiction and mental health services. That was a big undertaking. Uh, we've, dis we've distributed thousands of packets of Dispose RX. We've trained thousands of people in naloxone and delivered thousands of naloxone kits. That's just a little bit of what this committee did and what can happen in a very small rural community when people come together. I mean, there's no way that one agency could have done that all alone, for sure. Um, so we did all that and we were making a lot of progress. We went, in 2019, preliminary data indicated we went from 36 deaths per 100,000 and we had gotten it down into the teens. But then the pandemic hit and uh, so we don't really have uh, final data for 2019 yet, and I don't have any data for 2020. But I can tell you right off the bat, um, hospitals shut down, so our peers were no longer inv invited into the hospitals. Um, our daycare had to shut down. Our peers were just doing telehealth at that point. Our counselors had to learn uh, telehealth very quickly. Our IT department was pretty overwhelmed with getting everybody up and running because we weren't really ready for that. We were only doing like 1% telehealth at the time. Um, our community residents, of course, the capacity for that shut down, uh, our recovery center shut down, um, all the services that we developed and built and, uh, the access to care really took a sharp turn. So one of the things that happened was we, we tried to kind of reinvent people and, um, so for example, our childcare staff started making masks for patients because we didn't have any PPEs initially out here. I mean, we were desperate. And uh, so they started making masks for patients and for staff. Our peers shifted from uh, you know, meeting people in person and doing televisits to delivering medications. Um, our OTP has grown considerably since then. We were at 110 patients at the beginning of that year. It's actually at 190 right now. So that program, obviously had to continue to operate. Um, and, uh, and I will talk a little bit more about how we uh, creatively manage that without any um, COVID cases. Um, our residential program had to quarantine. 
So we closed our recovery center to the community and opened our recovery center to all of our residentials. And that really was a life-saving uh, thing because trying to contain people now in a residential program for staff and for patients, residents, it was uh, you know traumatic. I mean, they weren't allowed to even go out and to visit any family. They weren't allowed in the community, but having this recovery center was a blessing. Um, so one of the things that uh, we were very worried about because we were still new at uh, methadone was our waiting room could only really handle three people um, from social distancing. Uh, our secretarial area was wide open. Uh, we tried to build it so that it was not stigmatizing. We didn't have a wall or a window in between anywhere. So my staff were very nervous about uh, working uh, in that setting. Uh, so we worked with Dennis Romero from SAMHSA and uh, he worked with his boss in the DEA to get us approval to um, have an alternate dispensing location. Uh, so we used our Cody van, we used our mobile unit. Uh, we put it in our parking lot. Uh, we carried the pump out there every day and carried it back to the safe every night. And, uh, and we dispensed, we started dispensing in February uh, and we've been dispensing ever since in our mobile unit in the parking lot. It's only about 10 feet from our building. We're very fortunate. We have we own six acres in the city of Batavia uh, and the back end of our building uh, butts up to a, an old uh, factory that is mostly um, abandoned. So there was no real um, privacy issues. Uh, we had enough land to be able to do it all. Uh, I know some programs, you know, they just don't have the capacity to do that. But it really, um, I know that uh, you know on Facebook and some other areas, I just read a lot of comments about the patients who were very concerned about getting their care and about being exposed. And they were so appreciative of being able to um, pull up in their vehicle. You, we used the, the parking lot as a queue. Our security staff would just let them out of their car. They would go and be dosed and they wouldn't have to have any contact with anybody. And even the mobile unit had a, uh, a pass-through door uh, that we just put a shelf on and so uh, our staff weren't exposed and our staff weren't exposing uh, patients. So that's just been a blessing. Uh, I really appreciate uh, government. Uh, Dennis Romero was incredibly helpful um, and it really changed the life of, uh, for my agency, for my staff and for our patients. And it allowed us to continue to, um, I think, you know, deliver a service that was hugely needed. Um, it's interesting because if we went back, um, there was a survey done in, um, you know, somewhere around 2007, 2008, about whether or not uh, there was the need for this type of treatment in our region, and they found that there wasn't at the time. And then, you know, you roll the clock ahead to, you know, 2018, and now we have, in our small community, a small rural community, we have 190 patients. Uh, and then we also have probably 200 and something patients uh, getting Stabaxone and then a few getting Vivitrol. So that's a little bit about what we've done in our rural community and, um, and, and how we've collaborated with lots and lots of different organizations to make it happen. So thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I'd like to move now just to have a, a, a little discussion among the panelists about um, uh, what has been the key challenge that you are facing. So we've heard a lot about the organizations, we've heard a lot about the overall problem, but what has COVID-19 done? Um, what is the key challenge that you're facing because of COVID-19? Sheriff Apple? Um, I can speak a little bit about that. Um, we've had an issue, obviously, with um, group sessions. And um, I always, you know, people get mad at me when I say this, but I always think some of the best um, sessions were peer-to-peer talking about how they got in there and what they can do to change it and not come back and um, discussing issues, whether it was PTSD from the military or maybe they were a victim of abuse, whatever the case may be. And um, not being able to do that is what I hear um, is the issue the most from actually from many of the subjects that are in there. And they'll write letter and letter, but obviously we have to keep everybody safe and um, social distance and try to get through this whole pandemic. So it's, that's problematic. I think one of the biggest issues and even so on the outside and, um, you know, we, we were screaming and yelling up here, um, early on, even in COVID about, listen, we can still social distance and have group sessions, you know, and use churches or whatever the case may be. And, 
Um, and, and I think that was a little bit of a setback. And, and I think when people can't get out and talk and, um, and they're cooped up by themselves and, you know, they can't see anybody from the outside, limited ability to talk to anybody from the outside, it makes it very easy for them to regress and go back to, the, to what got them in, um, in the trouble in the first place. And, and that's an issue. Um, you know, we've been trying to work it around it, even inside the correctional facility, let alone outside it. But I think that's one of the biggest hurdles for us were the group sessions. Thank you. So one of the one one uh, key challenge is uh, how to have sessions um, allow interaction while uh, while we have social distancing. John, did you want to jump in? Uh, I would agree with uh, Sheriff Apple that you know that's been a really big struggle to get people to engage uh, in group uh, telehealth. So we've kind of shifted to more individual. Um, one of the I think unforeseen. Um, and, and we didn't we didn't um, address it quick enough. Uh, a lot of folks in our residential program were getting the stimulus checks, and um, you know stimulus checks are a great thing unless you're somebody who struggles with addiction. And um, so we actually had an overdose right in program from somebody who had gotten off of parole about two weeks earlier, got a stimulus check, and uh, we didn't know that they got their stimulus check and they went out and um, spent almost the whole check on uh, drugs and they overdosed in our program. So that was uh, uh, something that we started to watch for, you know, people getting their stimulus check, how we were gonna deal with them, getting a big chunk of money like that at, at one time. And this person was two years in our program doing very well, doing very well. So it was a, a scary time. And then the only other thing that I would say is that uh, most providers took a 20% cut or 20% withhold in the third and fourth quarters of this year. So I think all of us are concerned about 2021 budgets and how we're gonna to continue to main, uh, maintain our services if uh, you know there's no stimulus package and if our state uh, cuts us next year. Thanks, John. So um, what I'm hearing is that the answers to other program, other problems can cause uh, additional issues. Um, and then the budget I think is a is a huge worry for a lot of programs but especially, especially substance use disorder service providers. Debbie Ann. I, I think you know I agree with both John and Sheriff Apple. Um, for us we have to add workforce in there too um, and, and there are two components to workforce. One is being able to maintain the workforce fiscally and two is the fear that the workforce continues to express out of COVID-19. And so, you know, it's a lot of educating the workforce and then, you know, thinking about, you know, will we have vaccines available for the workforce? Will we be in the first round or the second round so that we can reassure our workforce that um, and we can provide for them and protect them? Um, even though we're doing social distancing and we're wearing masks and you know, lots of campaign around that. We're doing COVID testing through our federally qualified health center. And uh, we've made a lot of modifications. Um, we only recently started um, doing groups because our patients ask for it. So we have limited number of people who come in. So we're doing a hybrid of, of groups. And even that has raised some anxiety among our staff. And so we're looking and watching the numbers and as they raise, you know, to cut back um, some, um, to reduce the number of people we have on site. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, the, the struggles are um, the challenges, uh, not struggles, but challenges. You know, they, they not only affect us, the, the, the providers, but they also are extended to our patients because we don't have funding, we have to reduce for providers who have reduced funding, have to reduce the workforce. And without the workforce, those connections that were made, so people who are already feeling isolated who, and now to turn around and their counselors are not there or the um, social worker they're, they're seeing is no longer there, um, then that creates anxiety for them that has to be taken on by other staff. So uh, that, that's a, a significant issue for, for um, many providers, I, I think. Thank you, Debbie Ann. 
Um, what do you think, this is a question to all the panelists, what do you think the policymakers and the public need to know? Right? So we know that this is a problem and you've addressed several important uh, challenges that you're facing, but moving forward, um, hopefully we get a, a handle on the pandemic quickly, but the opioid epidemic still isn't going to magically disappear. So what do you think policymakers and the public need to know um, so that they can make good decisions moving forward, Debbie Ann? So um, Patty, and I, I said a little bit in, in, my, um, in my slide on the final slide, um, policymakers need to know that we must provide equitable care to people with substance use. And equitable care doesn't mean giving the same. Um, the infrastructure needs to be strengthened um, and also patients need more attention just as um, Sheriff Apple has done with his programs. Uh, for people who have um, substance use disorders, typically they have multiple disorders going on simultaneously. So we have to build infrastructures that are strong enough to support them through their journey. It is a journey. And so um, when we think about um, recently we've had you know, reduction in funding. We've had um, OMIG making some um, decisions that affect methadone programs. And so when we close programs like these and we leave patients out there to fend for themselves, uh, they really, you know, it's, it's very difficult for them to do so because access is already limited. And so we have to do everything that we can to expand access to care. And it's going to look differently for different people, but we have to find and understand that we need to make those investments. We need to make investments in the providers to keep them so that they can be sustainable because when we close programs, people lose confidence in the systems that we have established. Shelly. I mean, I think we have to really rethink how we approach our entire system. And Debbie Ann really touched on this. Right now, you know, our system's funded. It's like whatever we had last year, plus or minus some. And we've got a lot of systems in total silos. Um, and it takes champions like Sheriff Apple, for example, to, you know, how much work it's taking to bring these systems together and actually have them work together. And you have that repeating itself, you know, a million times around the country. And it's just incredibly inefficient. Uh, you know, COVID's really shone a light. And this is not just on substance use. This is on mental health challenges, on, um, you know, the, a lack of economic and social mobility, isolation and loneliness. I mean, these are not, you know, substance use and overdose, that's a result of all these things, right? And having a kind of a national strategy or a comprehensive strategy that addresses this root cause um, and helps all of our systems work collaboratively be funded collaboratively in a way that makes more sense. Um, you know, we've, we've been at this for decades and more people are dying than ever. I, I think we've got to really massively rethink and prioritize um, these issues. Thank you, Shelley. Can I chime in a little? Yes, go ahead. So I, I agree. And um, so one of the things, you know, uh, across the state where, you know, we've, we've developed these behavioral health care collaboratives, uh, we've developed IPAs, uh, you know, we're in an IPA with several uh, federally qualified health centers. There's mental health providers, there's substance abuse providers. Uh, but it seems like, you know, we're, we're spinning our wheels a little bit. And, and I think it would be, um, you know, the, we're all heading towards a, some kind of value-based uh, payment system, which we're not sure how that's going to look. And so, you know, a small provider like myself, um, you know, struggles to, I think, you know, understand uh, how to how to network and how to be in these these uh, you know bigger networks, right? So, anyways, I think some help maybe from government to help us see 
uh, how we're going to benefit from those, um, I think will be something that we're all going to need. I mean, whether it's kind of a, you know, it's beyond VBP 101, but there's still a lot of lack of knowledge out there. And I think also the integrated, you know, maybe the potential for the integrated OMH and OASIS agency in New York State um, and allowing small providers like us to not just be a single license provider, but provide maybe some healthcare and some mental health uh, so that there's no wrong door for people, you know, coming into our systems and the same on the other side. So. I, I also, I, I also think that it's important for us to look at some of the flexibilities we've had now. Um, I know um, in uh, New York City, we've taken advantage of, of quite a number of those and to make sense of the ones that uh, should stay, um, things like um, telephonic care um, and ensure there's uh, sufficient reimbursement for telephonic care because not all of our patients will be able to achieve virtual care. Um, and we're doing a lot of virtual and telephonic because that's the way we, we have to approach um, telehealth. Um, and you know the prescribing waivers, there are a lot of them that are, are good for our patients. And, and so um, I ask government to continue to support those and to make some of those um, based on research to see which ones we should. Um, and which ones we shouldn't um, make them permanent because they do open up access and we need to create access for our patients and uh, for our systems to be able to treat patients as well. We need to look at, um, as John said, uh, no wrong door um, and, and make certain that our patients have access if it's mental health or it's substance use. Um, we operate as a certified behavioral health clinic where patients get care across the continuum, no wrong door. And programs like those are important because they do meet the needs of our communities, and especially underserved communities where um, typically access is limited. Thank you. We're going to turn now, there's a number of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to turn it over to Laura to, um, to go through those questions with you. Great, thank you. Um, I, there's a lot of great support for the work that you've been doing. And I, I think that you should read through them because you're gonna really appreciate the positive kudos that everyone has been sharing. Um, one of the questions that we, we see is that we're seeing um, a lot of these overdose deaths most, more impacting um, black and brown people and um, underrepresented uh, members of our communities. And w why in particular is, is that occurring? And what, what can we do and what lessons can we learn from this to um, have an impact on those friends? Shelley? Mm. Um heard this in the chat and I know Debbie Ann had a response as well. Um, what the research is showing and that what we're seeing out there is that COVID-19 is exacerbating long-standing disparities um, in access to health and treatment um, among Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, even before COVID hit. Access to buprenorphine for example, huge disparity among people who are white, people who are black accessing it, people who are white access it, you know, just significantly higher rates. Um, you have a real challenge with um, over incarceration uh, of black and brown people who go to jail. I think it's nine times higher rate than white people for drug related offenses. Um, and a lot of jails don't offer treatment. Sheriff Apple is um, a real outlier. Um, we are seeing more jails take on access to treatment, um, including medication um, like buprenorphine and, and methadone, but that uptick is very slow. Uh, so people go to jail, don't get access to treatment, get out of jail, go right back, um, and unfortunately have adverse events, including overdose and death. 
uh, you know, COVID-19, I think is shining a huge spotlight on these longstanding issues. And there really needs to be a targeted and focused approach um, that really addresses this. Um, and so far we, we haven't really seen that. Um, I don't know, Debbie Ann, if you wanted to add anything as well. Sure, thank you, Shelley. And I, I think you're absolutely right. We need a targeted approach to address this. And, and yes, COVID exposed what was there. Um, you know, we thought we had clothes on and, and COVID came and showed that we were completely um, naked, uh, so to speak. Um, and, and so the, the disparities that have existed in, in health, and when we say health, it's physical health, it's mental health, it's emotional health, it's substance use. Um, in um, black and brown communities has always been there and has never been addressed. Um, it addressed comprehensively, right? Um, and so we've looked at outcomes for black and brown people in every area that you look at, including, you know, um, infant mortality in, <laughs> at this time, right? It shouldn't be, and, and you see disparities. So the, the system it needs to um, really take a hard look, look at research and, and use research to drive where we're going with black and brown people. Some of it is quite obvious. We look at the school system and, and how the school, it starts very young and, and it goes through. And so we have to start looking at um, from birth all the way through and our systems of care. So in the first system of care that most people encounter is um, education and so start there and start educating the public and, and you know what we're doing here we're making steps towards that we're educating the public about what's going on in black and brown communities and i think we have to continue to do that um, and continue to uh, and, and and even go a little further um, and and get government involved in um, addressing some of the issues that are there. There are the structural determinants that are standing in the way. Um, joblessness, um, you know, unemployment levels are, are, are pretty high for in, in, in poor communities. Overcrowding, um, housing situations. So it's, it's a lot of factors. I think that's um, all the time that we have today. So I would like to take um, a minute to thank all of our panelists today. Um, thank you, Shelley for, Wiseman, for your overview of the crisis and the snapshot of what's going on around the United States, uh, overdose deaths and seeing the changes uh, that we're seeing and the policy solutions that have been uh, impact, uh, put into effect and what we might see moving forward. And I wanna thank Sheriff Apple, um, John Bennett and Debian Fletcher Blake for all sharing your, your challenges that you faced, but more importantly, sharing the innovations. Um, it's really impressive all of the work that you have done over the past eight months to continue serving the communities that you serve. And I think that our audience today learned a lot of important lessons about how caregivers um, and leaders need to be flexible and meet the needs of the people they're serving. And thank you to Patty for your ongoing work at the Rockefeller Institute. And all this panel has been recorded and will be on YouTube and you should be able to find a link on that on our website so that you will have continued access to this great information and discussion. Thank you everyone. <laughs>